Father as well. And we see this as a basic mistake when people want to think about what is God. They think of some distant figure, some marble-esque statue sitting in the heavens. That's the first mistake we can make. But the problem is, whenever you see when God the Father is speaking, he makes it abundantly clear he is very personal. What I mean by personal is that he wants to be known by you personally, and he wants to know you personally. This means he experiences a personal joy and a personal hurt. This means that he goes out of his way to connect with you on a very human level. Um, I would say that when we start to understand that God is more human than we give him credit, and I don't mean infallible or limited, I mean in the way he wants to connect to us. That human impulse we have to be social and connect and love one another truly comes from God. Add to his being personal, he also is relational. He's relational. And we say relational a lot, and for this context I want to mean he is focused on relationship. Relationship. Relationships require two parties by dint of being in a relationship. Even if you're looking at a pure scientific, how does one thing affect the other? We see this in salvation. You have the relationship of being rejecting the cure or choosing to be in the family. Sanctification, you're walking with God day to day or you're not. Uh, creation, God says I made you for this purpose. I am God, give you glory, and I'm here to be in relationship with you. God is focused on relation. So one of the biggest areas we can go wrong is when we start to break this down in our mind and take God from a person who is intimately, personally, and relationally concerned for us, we can start to mess up sin. The idea of sin, this is where a lot of people go wrong, have a wrong view of sin. The problem is, when we break God down like this, we forget that sin is a personal and relational affront to God. A personal and relational front to God. Because by his very nature, he is those things. So when God speaks in the Old Testament, uh, sometimes he's talking about his glory, sometimes he's talking about sin. He takes a very personal and relational stance. And that's what we're going to see tonight. So I wanted to say all of that so we can have the mindset of what we're going to see. Because you got to remember, Jeremiah is a focus on a relational God who can secure you if you have faith in him. But also that that relational God has personal hurts from us that results in judgment. So here is God proclaiming to Jerusalem. This is a message that Jeremiah should go to the people. He's already been prophesying to them, wanting them to repent. Now he's going to the capital, to the center of it all, to Judah, and this is his message. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and proclaim in the hearing of all Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvests. All who ate of it incurred guilt, and disaster came upon them, declared the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans in the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, and they went after the worthless, and became worthless? And this is immediately our first question. It should be our first thought for the church. Why or when do we leave our first love? And we see this echoed when we see the church in Ephesus. Are we busy? And so in our busyness, even if it's to do God's work, do we replace the love we had with God with works? Do we have good doctrine, but no love and zeal about that doctrine? This is the, the, the thing Ephesus is accused of. Do we have sound, perfect 100% theological accuracy, but the love, zeal, and the heart condition is not right. Is that when we abandon God? Is that when we leave our first love? And really, every angry and bitter person who leaves God, leaves the church, and blames God will have to answer this question. Why did you abandon God, who is more than sufficient, to seek out worthless things that make you worthless? Which is a whole context here, a whole, not context, a whole idea in and of itself. God has an actual passion for you when he asks you this. Why have you left me and why have you sought things that make you worthless? In other words, when you take the idols, as we looked at last chapter, that are made by your own hands, gambling, drinking, sex, money, drugs, achievements, God considers them all as worthless. And he's saying, you've left me, who is able to do all kinds of things. And if you want to look at the kinds of things God is able to do, first of all, it's a miracle that he saves any one of you first, right out of the gate. 
Then it's a miracle he decides to stay with you. Despite sin, despite temptation, he stays with you. Then on top of that, he decides to have miracles done in your midst, like healings. Welcome to Trinity. We have them all the time. And that's right there. All of those things that God can bring worth, and I'm not going to get ahead of myself on my message because it's going to, he's going to ask this question multiple times. Why would you forsake me? Or any of those things, and as I just mentioned, could be you even replace them for something that seems right. I replaced my zeal and my passion, my relationship, in other words, with God for good doctrine, for religion. God doesn't want that. He wants your heart and your zeal above all. Then in verse 6, they did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? He who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. And I brought them to a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But then you came in and you defiled my land, and you made my heritages an abomination. And right here, I immediately got thinking. They came to this blessed land, a promised birthright, something given to their forefathers, given in trust to them, and they defiled it. I think of the churches that have left solid teaching, orthodox worship, all of these things, for any reason. Maybe they say God was too harsh. God doesn't expect us to change. They reject the call of the Holy Spirit. They call it emotionalism. They reject the miracles of God in their midst, and they say it's just a coincidence. And in so doing, they take all of the blessings that were given to us by the apostles and hand it down, and they defile them. They make their churches into tombs, into social clubs, where the Holy Spirit doesn't actually work. We start to see churches that get large, and they start to take the money, and instead of giving it to the poor, as we're called to do, what do they do with it? Immediately, we're using it for our own selfish ends. They take the blessed birthright of service, of humility, of the Holy Spirit and miracles, and they trade them for worldly things. That's exactly what Israel did here. And we're going to see how he does that, because it keeps going on. But then God wants to talk to the priests. And your priests did not say, where is the Lord? Verse 8. Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds, they transgress against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit you. So Baal. Baal means master. It's the chief idol of the Canaanites. He is a cruel, violent, and bloodthirsty god. That's the whole context of, of Baal. He is human sacrifice. And I want to add this thought to that point. The truth is, any idol and idea we replace God with is cruel. Is cruel. People don't think about this enough when we talk to the unsaved. They're doing a cruelty to themselves. Every time we replace God and all the good gifts with an idol of our own making, we are serving something that is innately more cruel than anything God would ever do in his judgment. But this next verse I want to give you, this is I enjoy verses like this, this and Ezekiel. There's moments where God sets himself up as either a prosecutor or a witness. And right now he takes the terms, and he starts using legal terms. So from verse 9 on for a bit, he's going to sound like a prosecutor in court. He's making the argument before the gates, you could say. Verse 9. Therefore I still will contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children I will contend. For cross the coasts of Cyprus and the sea... Or send to Keter and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. So he's setting up the question. See if this has ever been. And if you don't know where those places are, Cyprus is over here, Kedar is over here, or flip them. It's basically from east to west. He's picking two points on the map that are extremely far apart. He's saying, look everywhere. Ask everyone from east to west. See if there's ever been such a thing. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. So he's saying, look from east to the west. He says, find someone who will trade something that's great, that's valuable. You know, I get the image of the, like the gemstone that's great. Where is someone who will trade something that is worth that much for something that's useless? Then he says, nations don't change their gods, so why did Israel? Why did some Christians? Again, everything he's saying to these people who are his people who have gone astray applied in some way to the church today. There are reasons people trade something that's worthwhile for something that's not. Uh, their own pleasure, 
That's a big one. Their own ease, the Christian life is just too hard. Sometimes it's because there's hard truths in Scripture. They don't jive with what we think God should be like in our head. And sometimes, I want to tell you, it takes more patience as you study and wrestle over God's Word. And I'm sure Angus and uh, Pastor Don can attest to this. Patience to walk in the Spirit, to trust when you don't understand something about God's Word, than it is to make a knee-jerk reaction and move churches. To get upset and to walk away from the faith. But some people, that's what it is. There's hard truths about God that they can't reconcile because they're so limited. Seeing things darkly, but they want to trade something that's worthwhile for something that is worthless. They think that it's going to get them something, but it doesn't. So they change their God. And a lot of this that I'm talking about, and I haven't quite hit on the head, is heresies in the church. And heresy, essentially, the definitary definition is deviating from orthodox teaching of the church. I would add something else and say that when it changes who God is and who you worship, that's heresy. When it changes something from something that God is to something he isn't, that's when you're in danger. So that's his first question. Has there ever been someone who has traded me? Which is also interesting if you think about it. Nations don't change their idols, but yet people will leave from God. Verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fount of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they reject what is good, and they embrace what is useless. That's two different sins. They reject what is good, which is a rejection of God. They embrace what is useless. When we disobey God and try to forge our own path instead of relying on the Holy Spirit for guidance, we reject what is good. We disobey God. When we take things that are worthlessness into our ministries, here's one that my people might not like. When we try to imitate the world and be worldly in the way we reach the world, all, more often than not, it's embracing worthless things. We see this in the Christian music industry when there's tons of people in the Christian music industry that are not Christians. But they sing songs that sound like praise to God, and we give them millions of dollars. Why is that a thing? They don't go to churches. They don't have pastors. They have sin in their own life abundantly. But they profit from the people of God. That's worthless. That's worthless. I would rather everybody who listens to them and gives them money genuinely goes to worship at their churches and gives their money to help the poor than buying those albums and songs. But don't get me started on any of that. Sometimes it's out of the misguided attempt to try to reach the world by our own sense of how it's going to work. In other words, we get so focused on this will work, this will fix the world, this will reach the people, and it wasn't the way the Holy Spirit wanted us to do it. It wasn't what God wanted us to do. Um, the easy example is going right off the bat back when we start looking at basically self-help sermons. Instead of proclaiming what God is, which a pastor should be, proclaiming what God's word says and what the message of God is, instead we're teaching self-help jargon you can read on Buzzfeed. Again, they forsake the living waters. And if that, that should immediately, by the way, be an echo to when Christ says what? I am the living waters who drink of me. You will not thirst. Verse 14. Is Israel a slave? Is he now a home-born servant? Why then has he become prey? The lions roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without an inhabitant. Moreover, the men of Memphis and Tophanes have shaved the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he has led you in the way? Now what do you gain by going to Egypt? That's reference to the politics. To drink from the waters of the Nile. What do you gain by going to Assyria? To drink from the water of the Euphrates. Your evil will chastise you. Your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. For long ago I broke your yoke and I burst your bonds. But then you said to me, I will not serve. 
Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you bow down like a whore. He's referencing Sinai when they agree to follow God. He's burst their shackles. He's brought them out of slavery. Then, first, they don't trust a God to keep them safe. That's a whole other sermon about the way Christians view being personally safe, but I won't go there today. But he says, you don't trust me to keep me safe, so you'd rather go and you treat with your enemies, the Assyrians, who want you dead, and the Egyptians, who want you dead. And you're going to go take hosp hospitality. You're going to drink from their river, which is a sign of, I'm in your hospitality now. Then, after you've agreed to follow me and you've abandoned me for that, you tell me I won't serve you. I won't serve you. And he immediately references what they're doing at the time. And I want to paint you a picture of what Israel is doing at the time. Because there's some similarities for any nation that thinks it's under God and does things like this. The Canaanites all around them came into Israel and they wanted to change the way Israel viewed. They wanted to damage their relationship with God. We know this is actually a plot they had. I'm not conspiracy theory here with Alex Jones. This was actually something going on. The way they did it was with sex. The Canaanites are literally a sex cult. When he talks about these trees, the Israelites did this literally. They carved their trees into sex symbols. God hates this so much, he commands his altars be away from anywhere with trees. Cut down all the trees around them. I don't even want to be near them. He hates it. They did all this for the idols. And you ask, well, what about those priests? The same priests that God just said they're prophesying for Baal. Israel was in such a state of disrepair that the temple wasn't used. If you remember when I talked about Josiah, who was a little bit before this, it was so ill-used they didn't even know where the law was. They didn't even know where the law was, let alone what it said. And again, back to our modern day. Do we think we don't have a bunch of sexual deviants running around in their own cult? We do. Do we think that the word of God is being used and actually studied? It gets used a lot to proof text each other over the head. That happens. Or it gets used a lot. It's used a lot out of, uh, how should I say, not out of context, but by people who want to spread lies about the gospel. But there's a shocking underliteracy about God, even in our own views. When we do surveys and, and polls on the evangelical church, we find out that many of them are wrong on basic Christian doctrine. That if you just read the scripture, you'd be right on. Such things as faith is the way to salvation, faith in Christ, simple things like this, simple things about the Trinity. A lot of them, I think it was 36% of people polled a couple years ago didn't agree with the Trinity as a doctrine. A lot of basic things. A lot of basic things. So it's a land in disrepair where sin is rampant. God continues, Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of a pure seed. How then have you turned so degenerate? and become such a wild vine. Though you wish to wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. Wash as you might, soap in the way of the world, and anything of this world, any practice devised by man, will never remove the sins that you chose to stain yourself with. Only the blood of Christ will remove that sin. Only the blood of Christ. And we see here as God who's talking about all the personal affronts to him. And we're going to go back to personal in a little bit here. And he says, you try to clean yourself, to make yourself presentable. To put a good face on it. That's why you get the soap and the lye. And you think, I smell good, I look so good, this is a, a precious material. But again, no soap will remove your guilt. And we know in the church only the blood of Christ. Verse 22, how can you say, well, I'm not unclean. I have not gone after these bales, these idols. Look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You were like a restless camel running here and there, a wild donkey in the wilderness, in her heat sniffing the wind. Who could restrain her lust? None who seek to need, to her need weary themselves. In her mouth they will find her. Keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, it is hopeless, for I have loved foreigners, and after them I will go. He's painting a very grotesque image. You might not know this, but when camels are ready to breed and eat, they literally go berserk. They'll kill their owner that they've loved. They'll go berserk. 
They dig, in other words, he's saying, you have dug your heels in and become so aggressive in the defense of your sins, you won't turn away from them. You're like wild animals. And think about the New Testament, it talks about our lusts. When we're in our lusts, if you remember our series on sin, that's the time when it talks about this beast. It's like you're a beast following your own passions here. And what's worse is, you've given up. You don't strive for seeking me, for being holy. You say, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. Well, shoot, I've done the thing that's wrong. I'm at it. I'm just going to have to keep doing it. It's just my nature. I've loved, And by the love of foreigners, there he's talking about foreign ways, foreign beliefs. I've done it, so that's just the way it's always going to be. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 25. It's not chapter 2, it's chapter 3, but it should be chapter 2. It's the people who look at all that God has in the redemption, and instead of trusting, as my friend would say, believing that the God who created you, who is going to judge the heavens and the earth, who is eternal, believing that that God, could, could he, could he change your heart? Could he take your heart and change it? It's the difference between those people who are the saints and the people who look and they say, well, I'm bound to this sin forever. Till the day I die, I'll be sinning. I've loved the foreigners, after them I will go. Verse 26, as a thief is shamed when he is caught, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophets. They've lusted, they've loved, they've been spiritual prostitutes. And I love this point that God makes here. Like a thief, they're embarrassed that they're caught. But they're not embarrassed that they're doing it. And that's the difference between repentance, actual shame over what you've done because you've done it, because you've affronted the personal, living, and relational God, and embarrassment that you've been caught. We'll just sweep it under the rug. As long as no one knows I'm sinning, it's okay. How many times has that blown up and destroyed a church? How many times has that damaged people who have had people who should have been saints sinning in their life and now they won't come into the pews to hear God's word because they're so traumatized by the sins forced on them by others? It happens. Is that an excuse? No. But it happens. Verse 27. All those officials he just listed who say to a tree, You are my father. To a stone, you gave me birth. For they turn their back to me. Not their face. They're not seeking me, in other words. But in the time of their trouble, they say, Arise and save us. What nerve to abandon God for our own pleasures and then call on him to save us. But we do. We do. We deny God's hand in our life, in the lives of people around us. Sometimes we deny his call to our ministries. Every Christian should have a ministry. Instead, we teach kids they come from a slimy pond of rocks of chemicals. Then eventually those chemicals become monkeys and then us. Which I love here why he says, from the stone you gave birth to me. Yet, despite that being our view, that being our day to day, we're so educated. When things go to hell in a handbasket, we beg for God for prosperity. The audacity Israel has right here is that they removed God not only from their life, when we talk about a Christian from their life, they removed him from their entire land. Again, the temple was in disrepair. No one was coming in the doors of the church, in other words. And then they expect God to be present. But there's, there's disease, there's famine. Where's God? How could God not be here? There's enemies at the door. Where's God? How could God not be here? Where was God all the other times of your life? And God's simply pointing up the question, now you seek me. Why? And then he goes to verse 28, because this is the crux of it. But where are your gods that you've made for yourself? Let them arise and save you in your time of trouble. For as many are your cities, so are your gods, O Judah. So all of these idols, and again, think of all the idols a Christian can have. The list can be incredibly long. They got them all. All these different idols, all of them focused on different worship from sex to human sacrifice to war to prosperity, all of them, all the different ones from all the lands, from Egypt to Assyria to Babylon, all the mystery cults, let them save you. Let them save you. And this is a question that goes beyond invaders at your door from, you know, the Attila the Huns. 
Look at the lost and the dying around you. Volunteer in a school, tell me that your kids aren't lost and dying around you. Look at the kids who want to cut themselves. Look at the adults who commit suicide. Look around. Just take a look. One of the main reasons I have trust and faith in Christ is because I found nothing, nothing that can fix those people, that can fix me, that can fix the lost. It's a very practical thing in my faith. I do not care about when people tell me how I should be following God. I do not tend to care because the God I serve here in this church is the God that drug me down to this altar for sanctification, the God that drugged me out in the woods for salvation, and the God that has reached the hurt and the lost around me and through me. And here God is giving them this challenge, and a challenge to everyone listening. Try and replace me with your idol. Replace me with your idol. Let them save you. When the light fades from your eyes, let them be there to take you. When the enemies are at the door, let them be there to give you comfort. When you have the truly hard parts of life and sin, of death and pain and torment, let them give you peace. We know nothing but God will do that. Verse 29. Why do you have to contend with me? Why are you here to argue with me? You have transgressed against me, declares the Lord. In vain I struck your children, but they didn't take correction. Your own sword devoured your prophets like a ravening lion. And you, O generation, behold the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel, or a land of thick darkness? Why then do my people say, We're free, and we will no more come to you? Can a virgin forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me in days without number. And here's one for America. Has God been a wilderness to us? Even when we kept slaves, even when we butcher our children now, you can't deny God's blessing on our land. He says, I tried to correct you all the time. I tried to correct you. I even sent you people to warn you. Think about all the, the small revivals we've had. But by your own sword, you devoured your prophets. You struck them down. You wouldn't listen. And here's a really interesting point, thinking about God's relational his identity status he makes, he chooses to have with Israel. God wanted Israel to use him as an item of identity, of beauty, of relationship, of status, of power. He literally tells them, I wanted you to clothe yourself with me, with my presence. I wanted you to cherish me, to be that item from your youth. That item that your husband gave you that you treasure with all of your might. I wanted that to be our relationship. And here's one for the Christians. Do we wear and cherish God everywhere? Do we actually? Or are we ashamed of it? Do we have that embarrassment deep in our core? Is God our bold ornament that everyone sees that knows that we are marked out and different by the world? Or, I don't want to be that weirdo at work who talks about God. You know what, maybe if I develop a relationship with them that takes six, seven, eight, nine, ten months, then we'll be in a right relationship where I can share the gospel. The problem with that is that I have ministered to people who die before six or seven or eight months go by, and they weren't sick. I was glad I shared the gospel with them and they accepted Christ before that. It's happened twice in my life. Or are we too ashamed, too scared? Consider your heart. Is it clothed with the goodness of God? Do you cherish and seek him in that relationship? If God so far sounds like all of this sin is a personal affront to him, remember, he is personal, he is relational. It is. Verse 33. How well you direct your course to seek love, so that even a wicked woman said, who has, you have taught your ways, so that even to wicked women you have taught your ways. Excuse me. 34. Also on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. Yet you did not find them breaking in. Yet in spite of all these things, you will say, I am innocent. Surely his anger is turned from me. 
Behold, I will bring to you judgment for saying, I have not sinned. How will you go about changing your way? You will be put to shame by Egypt, you will be put to shame by Assyria. From it to you will come away with the hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust, and you will not prosper by them. So again, they're putting their trust in these other countries at the time, and they're going to fail them. The innocence there. Man, do we rationalize a lot. Do we rationalize a lot. Even in the church, we see this in different points in history. Webs we weave that rob and kill the poor. And then we say, surely I'm innocent. We trust in men instead of God, earthly powers instead of heavenly ones. We try and hide our guilt. This is one of the things that the church needs to take important note of. If you are guilty, the expectation is you confess, you repent, you have a shame. You don't hide your sin like it never happened. The New Testament standard was that you confessed to one another, to the saints. You didn't sweep it under the rug. But here they are. And the, the lifeblood of the guiltless poor, I want to give you this thought. There's a lot of guiltless poor that die today. It could be the people we fail to go and feed and clothe. Some parts of the country won't feed and clothe you unless you're a certain creed. It's true. Other parts don't want to have any services for the poor. The church should be that service. We should be there. If your belief is that we can kill our unborn children because they'll be poor, as people actually say, well, they'll be poor. It's better that they die than they be poor. And when he talks about the hem of their skirts, he's, the skirts in the Bible, it's their authority. He's saying, by your authority, the blood of the guiltless poor literally is soaking. But then he goes on. So he outlines all of these affronts, all of these offenses. There's a really interesting thing here, he says. If a man divorces his wife, and she goes out from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not the land be greatly polluted? You played the whore with many lovers, and you would return to me, declares the Lord. So it's forbidden to divorce and then remarry. It's like if she were to go out and remarry. But over and over and over, even with this call to repentance, even though God has just established this, we see that even though that would be forbidden, God is still willing to be that extra merciful. It should be a shock to you. To the Jews, this would have been an utter shock. He's literally saying, you have cheated on me, you've gone out, and if you were to come back to me, I'd take you back. Uh, we see this a lot um, played out with one of the prophets. Maybe what's the prophet? Habakkuk, right? No. No, no, no. I think it's Habakkuk. Sorry, it was in my notes. My mind just went there. Uh, one of them, by example, is to go out and marry Gomer. They have children. She runs away two or three times. Hosea. Hosea. Thank you. I think it was an H. I was trying to keep thinking about it. <laughs> uh, it. It brings to mind that because God literally uses his life as an idiom to say, this is who you've been. You've been Gomer the unfaithful. I'll still take you back. Entering into the next chapter. Lift up your eyes to the barren heights and see. Where have you not been ravished? By the waysides... You have sat awaiting lovers. Like an Arab waiting in the wilderness, you have polluted the land with your vile horde. Therefore, the showers have become withheld. Your spring rain has not come, yet you still have the forehead of a whore, and you refuse to be ashamed. In other words, they advertise themselves. Have you not now just called me my father? You are a friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken, but you have done all the evil that you could. And this, this is another thing for people. So they say, this is God. God, who is the God of my fathers, will he be mad forever? And then he's saying, instead of turning from your evil, once you have that thought, you try to squeeze every last drop of evil out that you possibly could. And I'm often thinking about the people, well, I, you know, before I die, I'll just, I'll just accept the Lord on the deathbed. You know, if God reveals himself to me when I'm laying there sick with cancer and tumors, I'm thinking of uh, one of D.L. Moody's sermons. 
And the point of his sermon, it was, it was a wonderfully simple sermon. He said, I don't even remember most of it, but it was, settle it now. If you don't know that you're saved, call on the Lord and settle it now. And I love this sermon much because that day, the miners he was preaching to went out into the mines. There was a cave collapse. And they brought a guy out, and his lungs were collapsed, and he was dying on the stretcher. And they brought him before Moody, and he reached out, and he said, I'm glad I settled it today. I'm glad I settled it. And we don't often have an urgency. We're used to thinking, oh, we'll live till 85. Again, I've ministered to those people whose life is taken from them in like this. For one lady, it was in a couple months. For another kid, it was literally this fast. He died that fast. That fast. But we want to do all the evil that we could. We want to stretch it all the way out. Could be a fear that we're going to give something up if we have to actually change and become better. Which, as always, cracks me up, the fear of the unknown, right? Like, there's a, there's a knife stabbing me in the leg. If I pull it out, there might hurt more, Angus. Well, if you keep the knife in, you're probably going to die. But there is a fear in the unknown spiritually that people sometimes have. It's idiocy. Fear usually is. Especially when you deal with God. Verse 6. The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what she did? That faithless one, Israel. How she went onto every high hill and under every green tree, and there played the whore. Again, this is literal and spiritual. And I thought, well, maybe after she's done all of this, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it all. So this is Israel that was already destroyed. He's saying Israel did it. Israel went to their very destruction doing it. I, and then Judah saw them doing it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. But she too went and played the whore. She took her whore up lightly. She polluted the land. She was committing adultery with stone and tree. Yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. Uh-oh. He's talking to Josiah. If you remember about last time, Josiah was the one who found the law. His heart was rent. The priest was rent. They looked at all they had done, and they repented, and there was a superficial turn of everyone around them. Are you saying that even in the midst of what seems to be a revival, it might not be sincere? And here's another thought for you. When you see the sins of others, God holds you accountable if you don't pay attention to that. How many people have had an example of both godly and ungodly people in their life, and they see the godly and the ungodly, and we see the outcome of sin and the outcome of righteousness, and we just don't learn by example? You know, it's kind of the condition with siblings. You'd expect my people with siblings, the younger ones would learn, well, maybe I shouldn't do that exact mistake my older one did. His people didn't do that at all. And God actually is giving them that. He's upset by that, in other words. And of course, they're not even honest in their rebellion. They're not even honest. They have a pretense turned to God, which is so much in my opinion, worse. I would rather deal with someone who's out and honest about their sin than someone who thinks, I'm good. I'm fine. Well, I go to church on Sunday. But do you know what it is to be saved? Well, I'm pretty religious. So no. So no. Again, God is what? Personal and relational. Which means if you have not personally met him and you don't have a relationship with him, you're not saved. You are not saved. I do not care. Like, that's the way it is. You're religious. Good on you. So is, so is every Muslim. You're not saved. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words to the north and say, Return, O faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. This is why. This is why they're allowed to come back early. Only acknowledge your guilt. That you rebelled against the Lord your God. That you scatter your favors among foreigners under every green tree. That you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. O oh, return to me, O faithless children, declares the Lord. For I am your master. I will take you. One from a city, two from a family. I will bring you to Zion. 
I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land, declares the Lord, they shall no more say, Oh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come in mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. First point, repent. Repent, I've taken to calling it the blessed arch of repentance that we all have to cross through on the path of faith. You will not, there's a lovely point in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, where by repentance you receive the letter, and if you don't have it and try to walk the Christian life, they don't accept you. You have to repent. And God is saying, if you will only repent, I'll take care of all the rest. I'll take care of teaching you. If that doesn't sound like the Holy Spirit's promise to the church, I don't know what is. I'll take care of giving you leaders. I'll take care of protecting you. Just repent. Just repent. And the Ark of the Covenant is interesting here. Let's talk about that just briefly here. There will come a time when faith doesn't need a symbol that God is among you, which is what the Ark of the Covenant is. This is saying, this is God's seat. This is where he is. Touch it, you die, because God is holy. You can even approach it more than once a year, you will die. But we know there will be a day when we don't need a symbol that God is amongst us. Welcome, church. We see it in the New Testament. We'll see it later in 31. We'll talk about it more. The Ark of the Covenant will come up. And then there's always the talk, where's the Ark of the Covenant? Some people think it's in Ethiopia. Some people think it's buried under Jerusalem. We can talk about that when we get there. Of note, that's interesting. When Ezekiel describes the coming glory of God, he doesn't talk about the Ark. It's food for thought. We know at this time it's in the temple. Some people think, again, the Babylonians take it. The reason we don't think the Babylonians take it is that the Babylonians talk about everything they took, and you think they've mentioned a giant, golden, precious box. They missed it when they ultimately destroy the temple. Spoilers, that comes later. 17. At that time, Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be called the throne of God. All the nations will gather to it in the presence of the Lord of Jerusalem, and no more will they stubbornly follow their own evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel, and together they will come from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers as heritage. Many people think this is from the diaspora when the Jews returned out of Russia from the north and came down and repopulated the land. I'm going to submit that this is one of those times in prophecy, and there are other times in Jeremiah, where we will see God's people, and in Daniel, we'll talk about that at some point, restore Jerusalem and the land. That part's already done. What hasn't happened yet is when the throne of the Lord will be in Jerusalem and all the nations will gather. And at first, it's going to be called the most wicked time on earth because there will be a superficial turn just like Josiah. If I haven't gotten it to you enough that God cares about your sincerity and the genuineness of your heart, the most wicked generation on earth in the end will be those that see God, admit he's God, but in their hearts they still don't want to serve him. Then will be the time of the new kingdom, the new earth. Just getting that out there. I don't want to go long into that. Because there's a whole... We can do two sermons on that. Verse 19. I said, How I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful to all the nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Isn't it bad when you surprise God and that's what he says? Just put that out there. Oh, of course, there's our brothers and sisters that think you can't surprise God, but God seems to certainly think so. Verse 20. Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so you've been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A voice on the bare heights is heard, the weeping and the pleading of Israel's sons, because they perverted their own way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, O you faithless sons. I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord, your God. Truly the hills are a delusion. Your orgies on the mountains, truly, and the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. But from our youth the shameful thing has devoured all for which our fathers labored, their flocks, their herds, their sons, their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame, let our dishonor cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers, from even our youth, even to this day, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Very interesting passage, I think. 
First, God is saying, I'm going to be faithful and save your kids. All those who are going to call on me in the future, I'll save them. They will recognize that they have done this to themselves. They've even forgotten who I am. They've forgotten who I am. If that doesn't sound like some of the hyper-religious, kind of mystery culty Jews of today, just throwing that out there, if that doesn't sound like some of the New Age weirdos of the Christian church today, who've forgotten who God is. But then, back to the people in the present. They're just going to lie down in their shame. Chapter 4. If you would return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver. Hold on. There we go. Uh, and if you swear, as surely as the Lord lives, in truth, in justice, in righteousness, the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. Do not sow among the thorns. I want to, before I go on with this part, he's talking about their heart. He's saying to break the calluses of your heart. Don't sow your seeds, as immediately thinks about the parable of the sower. Don't cast your seeds of faith among your doubts, your wicked intentions. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my wrath go forth with fire and burn with none to, to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. He wants there to be a spiritual change. And, and for a while I thought, man, it's really weird that God cares about circumcision. I've heard atheists talk about this a lot. In your most intimate moments and in your inward protected moments, God wants there to be a visible change and mark of him. That's the spiritual idea of circumcision as a symbol. There you go. He wants there to be a change that sets them apart. And this reminds me of an Ezekiel. And some people don't like this, but at a couple points in history, and this is one of them, God is pleading with the wicked. He is begging them. He outlines their sins. And again, I want to go back to why they thought Jesus was like Jeremiah, because he does the same thing. They plead with the wicked. And there's this heart-wrenching moment in Ezekiel where God asks them, why then would you die, O Israel? He just outlined all these things. He says, I will save you. I'll have mercy on you. I'll change you. I will make you holy. You'll follow me. Why then will you die, O Israel? And this is the condemnation for everyone who believes that God is wicked and doing justice. That he shouldn't avenge the times when we sin. Which I want to give you this thought on sin. Sin is not only a sickness, but we damage and offend and wrong all that is good in all of creation when we sin. And if you think God isn't right to challenge that, then anyone who's wronged you that you think should get what they have coming, he shouldn't challenge them either. Why would you die? Declare in Judah and proclaim it in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet through the land. Cry aloud and say, Assemble. Let us go into the fortified cities. The kicker is, they knew there was impending doom. It had been preached to them for generations. They knew what direction it was coming from. God told them in plain speech, and he offered to spare them, and they still wouldn't repent. Are we that different when we reject the gospel and we refuse to repent and then we get mad? How dare God have the audacity to have something like hell? Just food for thought. Raise a standard towards Zion. Flee for your safety. Stay not, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. These are going to be the Babylonians. A lion has gone up from his thicket. A destroyer of nations has set out, and he has gone from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitant. Nebuchadnezzar. For this, put on sackcloth, lament and wail, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. And in that day, declares the Lord, courage will fail both your kings and officials. The priests will be appalled and your prophets astounded. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, he does an utterance. Surely you have utterly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, It will be well with you. Whereas the sword has reached their very life. 
This draws emphasis to what God's done. He's very plainly in speech. It's highlighting the warning of God. God hasn't literally deceived them. The only way you can interpret that is if you understand that earlier God talks about the prophecies from Baal. He lets them follow idols, in other words. But he plainly warns them. And it really highlights the warning, because think about Jeremiah. Yeah, God, you really told them they were going to be blessed instead. No, this whole previous two chapters have been a warning. And at that time it will be said of this people in Jerusalem, a hot wind from the bare heights in the desert toward the daughter of my people, not to win over to cleanse. A wind too full for this comes to me. Now it is I who will speak in judgment upon them. Behold, he pump comes upon the clouds, his chariots like the whirlwind, his horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil, that you might be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts live within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims trouble from Mount Ephraim. Dan's the border tribe. He's like a watchman. That's what they do. Verse 16. Warn the nations that he is coming. Announce to Jerusalem. Besiegers come from a distant land. They shout against the cities of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are wicked. They are, they are against her all around because she has rebelled against me, declares the Lord. Your ways and your deeds have brought this upon you. This is your doom, and it is bitter. It has reached your very heart. I want to give a thought right there. It wasn't in my notes, but I'm going to do it. We, in our modern sensibilities, like to delude ourselves when we think about how virtuous we are. Oh, we really do. We're, we're good. We're really good. And one of the things that entertains me immensely is that when you study the actual abolitionist movement to get rid of slavery, do you know what the driving two ideas of these people in year, uh, England and the United States were? This is it. You were made in the image of a personal and relational God. So it's wrong for me to enslave you. Furthermore, there is a real and present judgment that's going to be brought on our nation for violating that. So we need to have a sense of urgency to get rid of this evil in our land. Then they would go on to say, and our belief is the belief that using that premise, you can fight any evil in any society, not just slavery. Because human beings are made in the image of God by a personal and relational God who cares about them, and his wrath and judgment will come. So anyone who says, well, talking about God's judgment and wrath doesn't get anything done, that's literally what motivated those two groups of abolitionists. Nothing else. So much so that everyone around them, even people who wanted to get rid of slavery in some distant future, you know what they called them? They said, you guys belong to some religious sect. You're extremists. Keep your ideas to yourself. You shouldn't be allowed to speak in government. Even the people who wanted to get rid of slavery who thought it would happen in 150 years. You're extremists. You're exaggerating. You talk about God's judgment. No, we're not going to talk about that. What was the fruit of their ministries? An end of the slave trade overseas first, and a gradual and eventual, rather sudden and bloody, I should say, end of it here in America. And again, is there a parallel to the United States? Well, we take those made in the image of God in a personal rela relational way, we pull them out of the womb screaming, and we kill them. At three weeks, they already have heartbeats, brains, feeling pain, reacting to stimulus. You know, I don't want to go full on and get me banned here, but if you don't see the parallels there, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But back in the day when it was slaves, black, white, Asian, didn't matter who they were, abolitionists got together and said, we are made in the image of a real and personal relational God. What we are doing is wrong. What you say is legal, is right, is wrong. We will be judged because of this. Repent was their message. We sometimes do a good job of that in the church. Sometimes we don't. We have entire churches that are, I stand pro-choice, so they say. Verse 19. My anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Again, think of this. This is God. Relational, personal. The walls of my heart, my heart is beating wildly. I cannot keep silence, for I hear the sound of the trumpet. I hear the alarm of war. Crash follows hard on crash. The whole land is laid, laid to waste. My tents are laid to waste. My curtains in a moment. 
How long must I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish, they know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. But how to do good, they know not. You understand, when we reduce God to a force, hearkening back to the beginning of a message, when God gives judgment over personal sins, he's pained. He's pained in a personal, real, and relational way. Verse 23, I looked on the earth and beheld, it was without form and void, and to the heavens they had no light. I looked to the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and behold, and there was no man, and all the birds in the air had fled. I looked, and behold, and the fruitful land was in a desert, and all its cities were laid to ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land will be made a desolation, yet I will not make a full end. For this the earth shall mourn, the heavens above will be dark, for I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, now I will turn back. At the noise of the horseman and the archer, every city takes to flight. They enter their thickets, they climb in the rocks, all their cities are forsaken, and no man dwells in them. And you, O oh you desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself in ornaments and gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you will beautify yourself, but your lovers despise you when they seek your life. For I heard a cry as of a woman in labor, anguish as the one giving birth to her first child. The cry of the daughter of Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands, woe is me, for I am fainting before murderers. This passage at the end, I want to leave this with you, is a glimpse at not only the onslaught of the Babylonians, but it's ultimately going to be a glimpse of the destruction in the end when God returns everything into like it was in Genesis, without form and void. That's why there's a split right there. Matthew gives us a warning that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, instant, like a thunderbolt that splits the heavens. No one will be ready for it. That's why I love people who tell me the day it's going to happen. You're Joseph Smiths? Yeah, it's going to happen in Missouri. We're a little late. It's supposed to be a couple hundred years ago. A uh, hundred years ago. The Lord will appear like a thief in the night. It will not always be as our fathers lived day after day. And this is the attitude that the church had. And I want to leave this with you at the end of this. When we look at God talking, again, our personal, relational God, we need to have the urgency, the urgency, that it is because of God's grace, his grace and his patience, his mercy, that his wrath and judgment isn't already here. And that before we know it, our time's going to be up. And here's the thing. Some people will stop and say, well, it's, it's, we don't know when Christ will come back. Which the other church lived that belief that Christ could come back at any moment. Even your own life will one day be asked of you suddenly. And you'll have to stand before a personal, relational God. And you can choose to stand before him as a Christian. And you'll have to answer why didn't you do all the things I asked you to do? That could be your conversation. Your conversation could be, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased. This is my good and faithful son. I adopted him into my family. He's done the work. Look at him. He's a friend of Jesus. Truly, I paid for his sins. That could be your conversation. Your conversation could be this. I don't know who you are. For all you religious people. I don't know who this guy is. Yeah, and you'll say, but I cast out demons. I did miracles in your name. Yeah, you did, but you never knew me. You neglected the relational, personal God. Yeah? If God just wanted garden instruments and shovels, he'd have made shovels. He wants you to know him. Your conversation with God could be this. Well, God, if I only had more time. If only I knew and I think of the man, in, uh, the man that Matthew tells us about when he died. And the Lord tells him, they had the prophets, they had the word, they had time. What did you do for the poor? That was also the condemnation of that man. 
Your conversation could be one where God says, and you stand before him in his wrath and his glory, in the full presence of him, the pit behind you, and God looks at you and says, let your idols save you. Let them save you. Repentance, the fancy word of saying you admit your wrongs, any of them you've ever done, the times you've laid waste to the land, so to speak, you've damaged those around you. In faith, you start that relationship with God who's reaching out to you so you can stand before him with a right heart, with a zeal in friendship with God, the personal, relational God who has been calling to you all this time, who's been calling to your forefathers, who's been even calling to the people who are going to come and strike you down, the God who is sufficient and can save even you. Even you. I don't care if you say, well, I'm not as bad as those people. Yeah, that makes you worse. At least those people admit what they've done wrong. At least those people, their heart is tearing because they lied to someone, because they cheated, because they stole, because they've gambled, whatever it is, because they've done some sin that has hurt other people. At the expense of others, they indulge their selfishness. We're all going to do it. It all happens. No one, remember what God just said about his own people, you said you've not sinned, and because of that, I will bring my wrath on you. So whenever God speaks in a personal, relational way, there's a lot that can be gleaned. So thank you for indulging me that we went a hair longer tonight than normal. I'm going to end in prayer. Lord, I pray that your spirit, in its personal and relational way, would go out and would touch the hearts and lives of everyone who heard, would even hound them and bring them, Lord, to you, face to face. Lord, we know that you care in a personal and relational way, so you wait for us to come before you to admit what we are and what we need, that we need you to change us, to restore in us the imagio Deo, to bring us into a right relationship, to undo the curse, so that you will use even men, even women, even children, even, even animals, to declare your good news, to call us to the way of holiness, and to bless us and everyone around us. Lord, that is what life is about. So Lord, I pray that the people who need to hear a warning would hear a warning. The people that need to hear a call to you would hear a call to you. And the people that need to hear a call to action would hear a call to action, Lord, tonight. Not for anything of my glory or the glory of the Nazarenes, Lord, but for you, for your spirit. The work of the cross. Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.